In this video, I'll be reviewing the most common problems when making flying geese blocks and my top tips on how to avoid the problems and have perfect or close to perfect flying geese every time. Hi everyone, my name is Ladine with Sugar Stitches Quilt Co. and I'm bringing you videos to help you become a better quilter. So your flying geese blocks turned out less than desirable. What's next then? I think it's important to troubleshoot and try to find out what you did wrong so that you can adjust as you need to. But it's also important to find out if you can salvage your block if you choose. There are a lot of things that can go wrong when piecing blocks. Even though flying geese may look complicated for the most part, there are only a handful of problems that we can experience when making them. Most of the time, what I hear from my students and my customers is that either their seam allowances weren't correct or maybe their fabric wasn't cut properly. It's also important to understand fabric bias and how it can affect your flying geese. Bias is the most likely cause of wonky flying geese blocks since the blocks involve multiple bias seams and edges. This stretch in the fabric can cause more problems than you realize. There are also a few other things that can go wrong. For this video, I decided the best way to go through potential problems and solutions would be to actually show you examples. Now these are intentional mistakes and adjustments that I made when sewing these blocks to show you what can happen in the process in real life. They were not super obvious, maybe an eighth of an inch or less in some places because I didn't want to exaggerate any of the mistakes so you could see how small realistic mistakes in the real world can actually cause problems. To me there was no sense in making large obvious mistakes because that's usually not what happens to us is it? Our first common mistake that we're going to talk about is not sewing on the diagonal. I have a flying geese block that I made with the one at a time stitch and flip method. On this side, I did everything correctly and my seam is sewn from the diagonal and everything looks great on this side. I have a little room for trimming here, but otherwise I'm happy with this edge. On this edge, what I did, as you can see, is my sewn line is not exactly on the diagonal line. And then you can also see here on the corner that my sewn line is off the diagonal point. There's the point of the diagonal and then my seam is just ever so slightly away from that. And as I mentioned, I wanted to make these errors what we may do in real life and realistic so that you can see what happens. So after sewing that seam, when I press it back, you can then see how my block is not the correct size any longer. A stitch and flip block, literally you should be able to fold that back, press it, and it's exactly the same size. But in this case, because I was too far inside, I have somewhat of a gap on this edge. So what would happen is when I go to trim this block, it's most likely going to be smaller than I need it to be. And with a stitch and flip block, if you haven't sewn it in an oversized manner, then that's going to cause problems because you don't have room for trimming. And you can see I've got my block lock ruler here. And if I line that up, when I make this trim, yes, I have room here to trim around, but then if you look at the bottom, my block is much too short. So I may be able to trim and get a quarter of an inch seam on top, but the bottom of my block is off. We wanna make sure that we're not only accurately drawing our line, on the diagonal, but also sewing on the diagonal from corner to corner. The next problem that we're going to look at is in the four at a time method where your smaller squares are cut too small. So in the four at a time process, you lay your two squares and you sew a quarter of an inch. If those squares are too small, you can see here what will happen is that they do not meet and overlap in this center point, which is where we need them to. What will happen is you will end up with something like this, where you don't have a quarter of an inch on top. And you can see this is the other half of this block. And in both cases, I don't have very much room at all. 
So if I looked at this and I wanted to trim this, you can see immediately that my top seam is not wide enough. So I'll talk a little bit later about the importance of making your blocks oversized so you have room for trimming. But when you make your blocks oversized, you want to make sure that you are adding enough space to the small squares and also to your rectangle. And if you don't have your proper sizes when you are making your four at a time blocks, then sometimes you can end up with the opposite problem, which is when your small squares are too large. I made this mistake really early on in my quilting journey, and I could not figure out what I had done wrong. And if this has ever happened to you, I'm going to tell you why it happens and what we can do about it. If you see here in the corner, in the point of our block, there is a little piece of fabric that is extra. And I could never figure out where that was coming from. And what it is, is that the smaller squares are too large. So they're overlapping too much when you sew them together. And then you end up with this little bitty piece of fabric. And as I mentioned, the first time I did this, I was like, how did that happen? And where did it come from? But I finally realized that I had added extra room to my smaller squares, but I didn't add it to the larger square. And you can see that not all of the flying geese blocks will have that overlap. It just ends up happening on two of them. You can see here on this one, and then it did it on this one as well. So always make sure if you're going to use an oversized pattern, that's fine. If you're going to add room to your blocks yourself, that's fine as well. Just make sure that you add an equal amount to both your smaller squares and your larger squares. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the video. The next problem that we're going to talk about is not aligning your squares properly on the diagonal. If you're making the four at a time flying geese method, you remember that in the first step, you have a larger square and you're laying your two smaller squares down first. It's important that those are aligned on the diagonal because otherwise you'll end up with maybe one block like this that doesn't look too bad. But what starts to happen is then you might have a block like this where your top is much farther over than it should be. And then here in the corner, you can see that we have a nice corner on one side the opposite side, we're off quite a bit. So most likely when we go to trim that, we're going to be too narrow in that area. Same can be said if you see my blocks, how I continue. This one is really far off. And then this corner is off as well. And so when I would go to trim these, I'm probably going to find some problems. And that's why we want to make sure that when you lay your smaller squares down, on your larger square and then the second step of lining up the smaller squares on your triangles that everything is lined up on the diagonal properly and then probably the most common problem that we're going to address is your seam allowance being too wide so again i have a four at a time flying geese and you can see where i have my drawn line my seam allowance was maybe an eighth of an inch too wide from that drawn line and so what happens is when we press these back, you can see as we did earlier, we don't have enough of an overlap in this area here, which is going to cause a problem. And then you can see when we go to cut our blocks, they're not aligned on top. And then also our seam allowances will be off when we trim these flying geese because we have not allowed for enough room here on top. So that will affect how much room we have on the top of our point to trim. So it's very important. I like to use a scant quarter inch seam. I feel like that is a happy medium in my blocks, but you never want to have a seam allowance that's too wide because it's definitely going to cause problems. Before we move on to my secrets to perfect flying geese, I'd like to hear from you. What problems do you have with flying geese? Leave me a comment below and let me know. Do you typically have wonky flying geese or flying geese that are too small or too large? Tell me about the typical problems that you have with flying geese. We haven't talked about the most common problem and that is wonky flying geese. And I have saved that for the discussion on how to achieve 
perfect flying geese because that is the number one problem that I see and it's so easy to address. So now we've gone through what can typically happen with a flying geese block. So you're probably thinking, well, now tell me how to get them right, Ladine. So let's talk about my not so secret secrets to perfect flying geese. Now this first tip may sound a bit strange, but one of the biggest tips that I have is to make sure that you are accurate in your diagonal marking. I showed you earlier that even drawing a line corner to corner can be a bit off and then sewing on that line or away from that line can make things worse. So you want to make sure that you're properly marking your drawn line. If you don't like to draw your lines, maybe you pressure squares like this in half and then use the crease as your guide and that's fine but again just make sure that it's accurate or if you're using other tools like a laser guide or a guide on the bed of your sewing machine no matter which method you use to find your diagonal line on your squares just make sure they're accurate otherwise you're going to be starting off on the wrong foot my next tip is a universal one and that's to make sure that you're sewing with an accurate seam allowance with flying geese i tend to like a scant quarter inch seam i find that my block is more accurate in size and it really allows a bit more wiggle room if i have problems i can trim later if you need help with your seam allowances i have a video to help you find a quarter inch seam and then also a scant quarter inch seam and I show you how to test it to make sure that it's accurate. Next, good pressing techniques will keep those wonky blocks at bay. Remember when we're working with biased edges in flying geese, you want to make sure that you're taking care when pressing because if you're not then you may be distorting your block. No matter which method you use to make flying geese, I like to finger press my seams back first. So in this one, this was one of my problem blocks, but I'm just going to show you if I would have sewn this seam, I like to finger press it back first lightly and place pressure there. And then I press with my iron. And remember we are pressing, not ironing back and forth. So you'll simply pick your iron up, place it down. When moving it, don't move your iron back and forth. Just pick up the iron and place it right back down on your block. You should never move an iron back and forth on a block because you're most likely stretching your fabric. A beautifully pieced and pressed block needs accurate trimming. This is a two-step tip because you aren't able to properly trim your block unless you've made it oversized enough to even allow for trimming. If you're uncomfortable with making flying geese, I would suggest that you look for oversized guidelines and math. If you aren't sure, you can always add an eighth or a quarter of an inch to each piece that you're using in your flying geese to allow for that extra room. Remember earlier I mentioned you need to make sure and add the same amount to your larger square as you are to your smaller squares. Same thing with the one at a time method. Oftentimes making your flying geese oversized can help with so many problems because it really just gives you room to trim it all away. You can trim the wonky or misaligned edges. And in my opinion, it's best to have more fabric to work with because you can always trim it away. You can't add to it if you start too small. If you find that you have a block that is too small, there really isn't anything you can do except either decide, is there enough room to still work with the block? You may end up with a more narrow seam allowance than you'd prefer, or you may lose the point of your block but that's a decision you'll have to make on whether or not you can manage. If you can't manage and it would make your seam allowances too small, unfortunately, you may need to scratch that block and try again. Even though I've covered the most common problems seen with flying geese, I want to share a secret with you. If you're like me, I can make some really creative mistakes. You know, the kind where you have no idea what you did wrong, that takes special talent. If that happens, I encourage you to look at your block and try to see what you've not done quite right. But if you can't figure it out, it's okay. It's okay not to be perfect. And that's where patience and practice comes in. Try a little something different the next time and see if that corrects your mistake. Get out your scraps if you need to and just practice. The most important thing is to keep going. And most quilters will agree there are no quilt police. Even if you can't get your points perfect or your blocks flawless, it's okay. Your quilt will still be beautiful and made with love. So what if it was made with a few tears or bad words? It will be memorable and so is your experience with making that quilt. I hope this video was helpful to you and if you like these types of tutorials then make sure to subscribe to my channel so you can catch all the videos that I post. So until next time, happy sewing and making flying geese.